Hello, Key West. This is Louis Patron bringing you the Key West Lou Legal Hour once again this week. I want to say hello, too, to the people who watch the show, listen to me, read my blog, keywestlou.com, who are in other parts of the world, I, you know, like Papua New Guinea, Calistorp, South Africa, uh, Rome, Italy, London, England, all over the United States and heavily into Canada. Uh, statistics, stats came in this past week for last month. I'm happy to say that now people in 49 different countries are watching this show and reading my blog. 49 different countries. I am blown out by that number. And I want to tell you also, I don't know why, but last month, Finland, Norway, and Malaysia had a significant increase in followers of this show. Finland, Norway, and Malaysia. I don't know how. Absolutely amazing. This has been a crazy week. Uh, every week's a crazy week. We live in a, a bad world. We live in a good world. We live in a topsy-turvy world. I sometimes don't understand why people do what they do. Generally, I do not understand why people do what they do. Let's start with the Iraqi war. As you all know, this week was the 10th anniversary of our invasion of Iraq. Uh, nothing to be, not a thing to be celebrated, not a joyful event. I, I can remember back when we went into Iraq and the decision was made 10 years ago. Bush too went on television and he said, and I quote, we are going there to defend the world from grave danger, to defend the world from grave danger. What was the grave danger? Weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein had these terrible nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs, and everything else, and he was threatening, they said, to blow up the world. Well, we found out there were no weapons of mass destruction. We should never have gone into Iraq. It cost us a lot of money and a lot of lives. I think the real reasons we went in are, are twofold. First, Bush thought that it was his obligation and a proper thing to do to democratize, to make a democracy out of any country that was not a democracy. Take a totalitarian regime, throw it out, and replace it with a democracy. If that was his goal, he succeeded. We now have a democracy and not a totalitarian government in Iraq, but it's so weak, it's not there solidly, and it may not survive another 10 days or 10 years. We don't know. But there is a democracy. Not a reason to spend all the money we did, no reason to lose one American life. If people want to live under a dictator, that's their business, not our business. The other reason, and probably the most valid reason of all, and this was for real, was oil. Iraq is rich in oil, and I'm sure Bush being an oil man and Cheney, an oil man from way back, were concerned with the United States, and they said, we're going to have all the oil we want after we, we take over. Uh, because we won't need Saudi Arabia anymore. We will get our oil from the Iraqi people who are going to be so happy that we freed them from Saddam Hussein. Well, we don't, we get very little, if any, oil today from Iraq. The Iraqi people are keeping the oil, oil and monies for themselves. They're not doing business with us. Don't ask me why. I, I suspect, and it bothers me, that Cheney, who turned out, in my, from my, in my opinion, to be not the straightest guy in the world. He was CEO of Halliburton, and he still had stock in Halliburton while he was in office, though it was in a secret trust. He didn't even know he had it. And I think his, he was thinking of increasing his holdings. It's a terrible thing to say, but we've all come to, I think, know the man Cheney. Uh, he was for Cheney. He was for whatever he wanted, his program. Okay, now. Why is this war so bad? Well, we lost 4,400 men and women. We lost military personnel. Our people, our boys, girls, men, and women, 4,400 lives on a stupid war we did not belong in that we were mid uh, misled into. The other thing is, these wars have to be paid for. Wars don't come free. Uh, there's no free lunch when you are involved in waging a war. Uh, the, the war already cost us, the Iraqi war cost us alone a little over $1 trillion. Between, and then you've got to tie in the medical. 
and the disability that we paid over the last 10 years for soldiers injured and maimed in that war. You see them with prosthetic legs, arms. Some people have no arms, no legs. Their faces are totally distorted. Plastic surgery isn't going to help them. We got to take care of them the rest of our lives. That's our obligation, and we are so doing. But that has increased the cost of the Iraqi war to three to four trillion dollars. Now, the problem is Bush never paid for the wars. This is a reason why you're in debt today. Bush never paid for the wars. He, he did it on a credit card. He, he, he fought the battle in Iraq and he fought the battle in Afghanistan on credit. He did not increase taxes to pay for it. He did not find money to pay for it. He did it and figured it, it would get paid for, as it was, but we owe the money. And uh, that's part of your national debt, friends. And the other thing, when these Republicans yell and scream, oh, all the money on entitlements, a big nut went there. And the, the other thing is, uh, during the war, Bush cut taxes two times. At a time when we're engaged in a major war event, he does not fund the war, and he cuts income taxes twice during that same period of time. You need cash flow to wage a war. He had no money coming in, he didn't plan on paying for it, and he reduced the amount of money coming in to the U.S. coffers. Now, during, let's go back and look how these how wars were paid for in the past, so you understand where I'm coming from or I make myself clear. Abraham Lincoln, the Civil War, he knew he had to pay for the Civil War. I've said this on the show before, the father of the income tax in the United States is Abraham Lincoln. He said, I got to have money to pay for this war. It's terrible. And the first time we had imposed on the American people an income tax. It went on right away and it stayed there for several years after the war till the war was completely paid for. When the war was paid for, they got rid of the income tax, but it was the income tax. World War I, income tax. World War II, terribly expensive war, huge war. 45% of the war was paid for with taxes, the rest with war bonds and things like that. No president has ever been afraid to raise taxes during wartime. Vietnam, the same thing, had to raise taxes. Terrible war, no one liked the Vietnam War, but raised taxes to pay for it. Iraq is the first war we waged and we did not pay for and we're still carrying that burden on our shoulders. Now, let's talk about the 30,000 soldiers that were maimed and were hurt in the war, they got prosthetic legs, they, some of them can't think, they gotta be taken care of in hospitals. Uh, these people have to be taken care of, it's our obligation as a nation. They want to defend us, so we are obligated to take care of them the rest of their lives. Well, these things are called disability pensions. There are pensions and disability pensions. It is estimated that the cost of disability pensions and medical medical care for those 30,000 soldiers will amount to 20 trillion dollars by 2019 that 6 years from now it's going to go up that much to 20 trillion dollars for a war we shouldn't have been in it was none of our business now It's not just this war, the Iraqi war, that is costing us money afterwards. We have always had this in all our wars, that there was, going, there was some sort of a pension system for children of those uh, who were killed. Uh, there's pensions for widows. There's disability benefits for our soldiers who cannot work ever again. Uh, all kinds of benefits have to come, and the government is obligated to pay them. Now, would you believe that today we are still paying pensions to two children of Civil War veterans. We're paying them $876 a month. Their fathers had to be 80 years old when they made them, and these people have to be over 100 years old. But it is documented we have two Civil War uh, veteran children who are being pensioned right now, paid for by the United States government. And there are other pensions that are being paid, and when we return, I will share them with you. Stay with me.
uh, before the break, I was talking to you about the ongoing cost of a war. The war, World War II ended in 1945. We didn't stop spending money because the war ended, uh, nor the Vietnam War when, when it ended, nor this Iraqi war when it ends totally will we stop spending money. There are ongoing costs. Some of those costs, two of those costs, include medical for the soldiers who were so hurt that they need care for five, 10, 20 years, the rest of their lives, and pensions, disability pensions, widows' pensions, children's pensions. It's an ongoing cost factor. I, I already pointed out to you at the end of the last segment, we still have two Civil War children being supported pension-wise to the tune of $876 a month. Uh, World War I, we still are paying out $20 billion a year in pension money. We have soldiers over 100 years old, many of them still alive or, and or their families. Uh, World War II is in the billions of dollars, the ongoing cost. Vietnam costs us $33 billion a year today for medical, pensions, disabilities, and so forth. The Korean War, small war cost-wise, $3 billion a year. The total, the total cost of people uh, remaining, left over, who were hurt, maimed, in all these wars in the United States that we're still paying for with regard to medical care and disability amounts to $40 billion a year. $40 billion a year. These are the little things we don't know about. It's an ongoing cost factor. Just sharing the information with you. Now, I want to talk about the president. I love Obama. Uh, I supported him twice. I still think he's terrific and he's doing a great job, does not mean he is doing a perfect job. And I think one of the places where he's screwing up, and I'm getting fed up, is with uh, cutting entitlements, things like Medicare and Social Security. I believe Obama wants to be known as the great compromiser, that he was able to negotiate with the other side of the aisle, with the Republicans, that he was able to create bipartisanship and that he was able to get many laws passed because he knew how to deal with the other side, give and take. What I don't like is that in his first election campaign and in his second election campaign, he said Social Security and Medicare were sacrosanct. No way were they going to be touched. Well, here we are now. And he's willing to compromise on the entitlements, and he suggested some ways of doing it. Uh, and he's got some plans for cutting Social Security. Not bad, but he's planning on cutting it and Medicare in a certain way. And to me, when you give a little bit, you end up giving a lot. It's the beginning of an avalanche, okay? Uh, what he's trying to do is make the seniors pay, make the seniors pay for the rich going on and living the way they are in this country. Doesn't make sense to me. And I say this, and I tell my friends, fellow seniors out there, because I am a senior, when the government gets rid of subsidies to oil companies, that's right, you know it, we pay money every year to oil companies, they're called subsidies, in the billions of dollars to help them get through that year economically. When we're paying four dollars a gallon for gasoline, they don't need it, and we know how wealthy the oil companies are. We pay farm subsidies. We pay farmers not to farm in this country because we won't, don't want to screw up the production level of certain uh, goods like uh, vegetables and fruits. We pay them not to farm, not to farm. And many farms today isn't the you know, mom, and pa, and the kids' little farms. They're run by corporate America. They are big entities. And they are getting subsidies not, not only to not farm sometimes, but when they do farm, they're getting subsidies to help them get ahead so they can make a profit. I mean, this is the forebearers of the Publix, you know, uh, uh, of any other kind of supermarket in this country. Uh, they don't need that kind of help from our government, especially when it's got to come out of your pocket and mine via cuts in Social Security and Medicare. And what about the major corporations in this country where the CEOs 
the CEOs, these guys are earning 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 million dollars a year. Bank presidents getting bonuses of 20 to 40 million dollars a year. Absolutely unheard of, absolutely disgusting. And at the same time, these major corporations, they have yachts. They may be 140 feet, 160 feet, whatever. And these yachts cost three to four million to 300 to 400 million dollars. And they get a tax write-off on them because it's a business deduction since they entertain clients on the boat and they do business on the boat. They get a write-off for that money to that extent. And, and then you've got the private jets. All major corporations, even small ones today, have jet planes. So they can get here and there. Uh, their officers can travel in luxury generally. That, so they can take our congressmen on these junkets and, and to these conventions all over the world, and they get to write those off as a business expense on their taxes. Well, when we get rid of the oil subsidies, when we get rid of the farm subsidies, when we get rid of corporate America being able to write off yachts and private jets, then I say, hey, okay, the rich did their share. I mean, they, they got their taxes increased a little bit. That 2% then I'm willing, and you should be willing at that time, to give up a little bit with regard to Medicare and Social Security, but not before. The other thing, this galls my butt. Boehner came out this week, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. He's been yelling and screaming for five years that we have an economic crisis, we must deal with it or, with it, or this country is in terrible shape. And, you know, I always thought, any crisis is 15 to 20 years down the road. And if you check the economic health of this country from 1850 to today, you will find that the economic life of the country was always questionable 15 or 20 years down the road something was going to happen. But things happen to, to correct it, not intentionally sometimes. So he's scaring the people for no reason, in my opinion. And this week, he admitted it, in effect. He said, he went on TV, and Boehner said, there is no immediate crisis. He agrees Social Security is at least 15 years down the road. There is no immediate crisis. But, he said, it's coming, and we have to deal with it. Garbage. Okay, now we're going to go someplace else. We're going to go to Cyprus. You know what's been happening in Cyprus this week? Terrible, terrible. First of all, the worst thing that ever happened to Europe was the euro. You know, uh, what, 15 years ago, uh, 17 European nations decided uh, that they were all going to get together and they were going to have their own banks and they were going to have their own currency, one currency called the euro, and they could borrow from each other from their central bank, the European Central Bank, uh, which is really the euro bank. And it would be one happy family. Whenever you needed money, you got it. Our economies will all be strong. We will make money. Well, it didn't work out that way. And you know that Greece is in terrible shape. Italy's in terrible shape. Spain and Portugal also. And many other countries. Germany is not. Germany's the major lender to everybody here. And they're coming out big time on this stuff. Anyhow, little Cyprus this week, who's in trouble financially, had a situation occur that I feel could happen somewhere else and maybe here. And it's what I wish to talk about uh, starting now and going into the next segment. What happened is this. Personal bank accounts, deposits in all banks in Cyprus, checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, whatever you had in there. The Euro Bank wants to attach that money and take out a certain percentage to help pay the debt. In other words, if I've got $100,000 in the bank in the United States, they want to come and take 5% of my 100000 to pay the tax of the United States government to Germany. No way, Jose. Stay with me. I'll be right back. Louis Patron back with the Key West Lou Legal Hour. Thank you again for joining me this morning. I was talking about Cyprus. Cyprus is part of the Euro Union. They're broke, like most of the countries are in Europe. This is an, an international recession we're in, not just the United States. Every country is suffering, except one or two or three 
Germany being one that's in good shape, and France is in good shape also. But the rest of the world's teetering. China's in trouble. Japan's in trouble. Everyone's got dollar problems. Okay. Now, Cyprus needs money. They need a bailout. Like we bailed out the banks. We bailed out General Motors. Cyprus needs a bailout. They owe money. They borrowed money way back when uh, from the Euro, uh, Euro Union Bank. They borrowed a lot of money. And they can't make their payments now. Germany's the one who's got most of that money coming back. Germany wants their money, and they want it now. They don't want to wait. They're not compromising. They don't compromise with anybody. They're hard ass all the time. Be that as it may. Right now, they... Cyprus needs a bailout of around $14 billion, $14 billion, our money, okay? And they, they haven't got it. And so the Eurobank says, look, if you put up some money, we'll give you the rest. And they want, they want the Cyprus people to put up $7.5 billion, and they'll put up the rest, and they'll get this money back to take care of their country, make it survive for another six months. Where are they going to get the money, Cyprus? Cyprus says we haven't got the money. We can't tax the people anymore. We tax them to the hilt. We tax everything, okay? And so <laughs> the Euro Bank says this is what you're going to do because the bank tells you what to do when you owe them money. The bank says this is what you're going to do. We're going to take your deposits. Cyprus is rich in deposits. I'll get to why in a minute. They've got a lot of money in their banks. We're going to tax. We want you to tax your banks your deposits, 3% for any account under, under 100,000 euros, over 100,000 euros, 9%. You just take it out of their deposits like that. Take it right out of their accounts. Can you imagine a bank taking your money out of your account like that? And it had to be approved, of course, by the Cyprus uh, legislature, which voted it down, uh, because the people would have lynched these guys. The people were in the street demonstrating this is stupidity. Who's ever heard of taking people's money out of a bank account to pay a national debt? So the banks have been closed, by the way, since last Monday, and they're not due to reopen now till Tuesday if they do open. People can get money out, can take their money out, but only via the ATM machine and only to the tune of 500 euros a day the lines are long at the ATM machines, taking out the 500 euros a day. Uh, so if something bad happens, they'll be taxed less or all their money won't be gone. I don't know what's going to happen. Let Cyprus go bankrupt. What, what can anybody do to them? Are they going to send an army in there, the Germans or somebody else, and occupy the country and say, until you pay us back like a debtor's prison, we're running the country? Uh, it's a bad deal to begin with. Everyone was wrong in making it, including the people who are benefiting from it, like Germany. I'm very anti-German on this issue. I'm not anti-German. I'm anti-German on this issue because they've been pigs. They've been like banks, and they are putting the stranglehold on the debtor now who they overgave money to. They didn't bother checking credit or anything. Why did we have the mortgage foreclosure problem in this country in 2008? Because the banks just loaned money. They just wanted to loan it. They didn't care. Same thing here. Now, why all this money in Cyprus and the deposits? Well, apparently Cyprus pays good interest rates. Russia, people from Russia have one third of the deposits in Cyprus Bank. So Russia is very much concerned about this whole thing because it's their people's money that's going to be grabbed. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know this. We have to watch out. If this is permitted to let a nation dip in to someone's personal savings account or checking account in one place, in one country, it will happen of other places in the world. And it could and probably would happen in the United States. You know banks. Once they figure out there's another way of making money or earning a buck, they do it. Think about it. Bounce checks are now $45 a piece. They used to be a dollar, I remember when I was young. Uh, your ATM costs go up just to use an ATM machine uh, if it's not your bank. Everything goes up with the banks. They charge for everything. And uh, they'll do this too. They'll do this to us. And you say, and I've read this this week, well, we've got this federal deposit thing. Our, our accounts were guaranteed. Do you remember? They were insured by the federal government up to $100,000. And under the recent Dodd-Frank Act, 
that limit has been extended to 250000 which means, in effect, if you've got $250,000 sitting in the bank, and for some reason the bank goes under and loses that money, the federal government's going to give you back your $250,000. Good luck. I'm going to tell you why. There is not enough money in the United States Treasury, there is not enough money in the United States Treasury to pay for all the bank accounts that would go under if they were all called at one time. So, Cyprus, watch it closely because what's happening there may happen in another place, here. Let me say something else about banks. I think banks have gotten too strong in this country. Uh, Think about it. In the last 20 years, they've gotten too big. They were too big to go under in 2008, do you remember? We had to bail them out with taxpayer dollars. Because the, they can't go bankrupt. They're too big. Too big to go under. Can't do it. And we bailed them out. And it didn't do the people any good. It just did the banks good because they didn't loan the money to anybody. They just invested it, made money, and paid the government back. And they didn't care that the people on the street, little businesses, couldn't borrow money to survive. Now, I told you last week about the HSBC Bank, a British bank with many branches here in the United States. They have been laundering money, uh, drug money primarily, from the Mexican and Colombian drug cartels through their banks. Now, money laundering is terrible. Put in dirty money, take out clean. Well, they did it to the tune in the United States of $200 trillion. That's a lot of money. It's much more than our national debt, $200 trillion. And the bank got paid for this on a per month basis, $1.9 billion. They made $1.9 billion a month just for doing this. The federal government, our government investigated, the attorney general holder was right in there and found wrongdoing. Well, the bank said, we're sorry, we won't do it again. No one was arrested, no one was indicted, no one was tried, no one was sent to jail. Just as in 2008 when the banks were too big to fail and they made a lot of mistakes and screwed a lot of people, think of the mortgage situation. Now today, they're, they're, they're too big to prosecute because as Holder said, not Lewis, Attorney General Holder said, it would create a national crisis or and an international economic crisis. So the banks have gotten powerful. They have to have their wings clipped because you don't want the banks telling you how to live your lives. That's not the way things were supposed to be. I want to give you some quotes I came across recently that, that back up what I'm saying and back up what you're thinking. Uh, the danger of banks. First one is by Thomas Jefferson. I am going to read it because it's lengthy and I want to get every word out there. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless, said by Thomas Jefferson. He also said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. True then, true today. Now, John Adams, another president of the United States, John Adams said this about banks, and I read it again to get it all correct. Quote, banks have done more injury to religion, morality, tranquility, prosperity, and even wealth of the nation than they have done or ever will do good. And Lord Action, he said it best of all, and I quote, Listen to these words. The issue which has swept down the centuries and which will have to be fought sooner or later is the people versus the banks. The people versus the banks. We're there today, my friends, and we have to start taking control of the banks in this country through legislation, through congressmen who think of us and not about the banks and corporations. We've got to do this or they're going to do this to us. They're going to choke us. Stay with me, I'll be back. Louis Patron back with the Key West Lou Legal Hour. Thank you again. I always say thank you because I appreciate the fact that you listen in. And uh, listen to my thoughts. You don't have to agree with them, just let's share. 
There are some other things I do I want you to be aware of, because you may enjoy them also if you're not already enjoying them. I do a blog every morning. I get up, I sit down at the computer, and I go ba ba bing and it's called KeyWestLou.com. KeyWestLou.com, and it's my life in Key West the day before. Today I talked about bocce, because we played bocce last night. I talked about the Blue Devils who flew into Key West yesterday, right down Duval Street Low. I talked about Eugene Robinson, the Pulitzer Prize winner, Washington Post associate editor, uh, who's in Key West speaking tonight at 6 o'clock because his wife's an artist. She's had a show here all week, but he's going to give a little talk to us tonight. Nice to have him here. Uh, I talked about things like that. I, I talked about the fact that I couldn't get out to lunch yesterday because I was so busy preparing for the show. Uh, I talked about Syracuse basketball. We beat Montana, thank God. I hope we beat California Saturday, and things like that. So please read it. You may enjoy it. I think you will. I also write a column once a week for Conk Life, a local weekly newspaper, about one of the issues I'm talking about here. It's, you know, I expand on it. I, I also publish an article once a week on Amazon Kindle. Uh, so this, and I'm doing a radio show now, Blog Talk Radio, on Tuesday nights at 9. And you can find all these things, by the way, just by reading keywestlu.com. I give instructions for everything a day or two before it's coming up. I started two months ago doing a talk radio show. It's now 9 o'clock at night now, Black Talk Radio on the Internet. And uh, in just two months, I'm over 2,000 listeners a week. I had eight the first week. I, I think it's absolutely amazing. And it's, you know, current events talk show. You may enjoy that. Look for it, Black Talk Radio. Read my blog, keywestlude.com. It'll take you everywhere. All right, I want to talk about guns in this country. I want to talk about the assault weapons ban. It was announced this week by Senator Reid, Democrat Majority Leader. She said he could not make the assault weapons ban part of the gun package because he did not have the votes to get it through. Uh, he did not have, even though the Democrats control, control with 53 votes, that's more than half, of the United States Senate, he could only put together 40 votes from both sides of the aisle. It will go down to defeat. And in this case, he happened to need 60 votes because they said, the Republicans said they would filibuster. Let me take this one step at a time. Filibustering has been screwing up this country for the last 10 years. It's not being used properly. It's been misused primarily by the Republicans since Obama has been elected. The first day of every start of a United States Senate, they can change House rules. Filibustering is a House rule. And it could have been changed at the start of this legislative session. Reid had the votes. Reid said he was going to do it so that we didn't, don't need 60 votes to pass something. We just need a mere majority as the Constitution intended all right, because this filibustering 60 votes is man-made law, like different from the Bible. It's not in the Constitution. It's what the legislators dreamed up on their own. And uh, we would only need 51 votes to pass anything. Then we'd probably get this assault weapons ban at least passed in the United States Senate. But he said no. He didn't do it. He didn't get rid of the filibuster because his friends across the aisle, screw them, his friends across the aisle, because they're doing that to him now, said they would handle this in a more gentlemanly fashion. They would not use it that much. They use it at every turn. It's only, we're only into the third month of the year, and I don't know how many times they have threatened filibuster, which kills something. Now, these assault weapons, these, I, I call them machine guns. They're big. They're automatic guns. They go boom, 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 100 rounds a minute, 30 rounds a minute. The type of guns that went into that school in Connecticut and killed 21st graders and six teachers. That kind of gun should be banned. I don't know why people need those kinds of guns. I know there's a Second Amendment. Let people carry a, a pistol. Uh, let them have a rifle. Let them have a shotgun. This takes care of hunting. Why do you need a rapid-fire assault weapon for sports or anything else? For protection. They're worried the government's going to take over the country. That's their problem. The, they're scaring us. They're, trying to, they're scaring the people. And what happens, though, is this. The NRA, the congressmen 
who get contributions from the NRA, who ride on their corporate jets, okay, who visit corporations in America that are happy with the gun situation, they won't vote for this stuff. Something like 90% of Americans agree that we should investigate more thoroughly people who apply for a license. Everyone should have a permit, rather, to, to carry a gun. They don't even want that. They don't want anything like that. So what's going to happen is another Connecticut school situation where children get killed. How many children have to be sacrificed? How many people have to be killed? On my way in this morning, driving into the studio here, on the news, I heard the following. A mother, I don't know where, I can't recall, not important, walking down the street carrying her baby. Two teenagers came up with guns and said, give me your money. She says, I got no money. They shot her first. They shot her in the leg. And she's clenching her baby, trying to protect it. And they shot her baby in the head and killed the baby. Teenagers, guns on the street. How, how much longer must we go on with this? The millions of people that have been killed in this country in the last 50 years by weapons that should not be out there. The children that have been killed. We're a sick society when our leaders can't do the right thing because they're worried about getting reelected, they're worried about where money's going to come from to support them, and so forth. If they can't stand true and be people of strength and independent mind, then let them go out and get a job like everybody else and work for a living instead of being a congressman. Do your job. They're not, and that's why the people are going to get screwed on the gun issue. I didn't think it could happen. Let's go now to Afghanistan. His name is Karzi. We've all heard of Karzi. He's the president of uh, Afghanistan. He's the guy who comes to this country, he's got a green hat on, and he wears this flowing green robe all the time. Uh, Karzi, we put him in there to lead the Afghans. He's not doing a good job. They're going to have elections next year. He's going to lose. He is going to lose, no question about it. He's fearful. He wants to stay in office. He needs our, our army there to keep him in office, and we're going to be out of there. And make a long story short, he said uh, two weeks ago that the American soldiers were killing people in one of the provinces. We had to get out of the province. He said another time that the American soldiers and the United States government were working against the Taliban. They shouldn't be doing that. Garbage. This guy's trying to appeal to his people to show that he's a good guy. I'm on your side. I hate the Americans, the people who helped us all this time. And he wants to stay in office. He's already pocketed, I'm sure, millions of dollars because our government through the CIA pays millions of dollars to these people who run these governments, allegedly for us. Nothing's for us. This guy's a scumbag. And I got a feeling he's going to be hanging from a pole like Mussolini in about a year and a half. Okay, we're going to break very shortly here. Uh, and uh, are we going to break? Well, we've got 30 seconds. I'm sorry. They forgot about me. See, it happens. Anyhow, uh, when we return from break, I'm going to talk about this day in history, March 22nd. Some interesting things happened on this day, and I want to share them with you. Stay with me. I will be back. Hello again. This is Louis Patron bringing you the final segment of the Key West Lou Legal Hour for this week. I want to talk about this day in history. Occasionally I do this, this type of thing in the show, because sometimes back in history there are interesting things that touch on other things that occur in our life. So on this day in history, on March 22nd, in the year 1349, way back when, 1349, watch what I'm telling you. In Fulda, Germany, a town in Germany, Fulda, Germany, the townspeople massacred all the Jews because of the Black Death, the bubonic plague. They said the Jews were responsible for the bubonic plague, that thing that was spread by rats all over Europe in those days. For the bubonic plague, they had to blame someone, and they blamed the Jews, and they massacred all of them. Why am I sharing this with you? Because 
beating up on the Jews, killing them, massacring, did not start with Hitler, Germany, and the Holocaust in World War II. It started way back when, and I'm sure even before 1300. 1457, this day in 1457, big day. The Gutenberg Bible, Gutenberg Bible was printed. It was the first book ever printed. That's where it all started, the newspapers, the novels we read, the textbooks, everything else. And you know the strange thing, we see, we're getting away from that now. We're going to the internet now for, I, we're, we're making that transition from print to internet. And I, 20 years from now, I wonder where we're going to be, how many books we're really going to have. We're going to have any books, any newspapers, or is everything going to be on the internet? Then comes 1903 big year. We're going to talk about the New York Yankees and how they got started and how they got their name. The New York Yankees did not begin in New York City. They began in Baltimore, Maryland in the year 1901. They were known as the Baltimore Orioles. Two years later, they moved to New York City and they moved to the Bronx on a bluff where Yankee Stadium sits today, the old Yankee Stadium. And the team still wasn't called the Yankees. It was called the New York Highlanders. The bluff was high, Highlanders, okay? And that's the name it had until 1913, from 1903 to 1913 for 10 years. What happened was during that time, the newspapers found that the word Highlanders was too large to print, too large for a title, it was just too many letters. So for whatever reason, nobody knows why, they started calling the New York Highlanders the New York Yankees. And finally in 1913, on this day, on this day in 1913, the Yankees, the New York baseball team, adopted formally the name Yankees. Now we go to 1933. Most of us in this country enjoy a drink or two. I won't deny that I enjoy a drink or two. There was a time where we had prohibition in this country. You couldn't buy alcohol. It was against the law. It was a major disaster. The law was a disaster because it, it, it created a, a criminal industry that's with us even to today, I believe. Uh, the people who got together, who made money off of alcohol, bringing it in illegally, producing it illegally. And because the, the country wanted to drink, there are certain things you can't take away from people. The country wanted to drink. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in 1933, on this date, signed the legislation making alcohol legal again. The first step was to make wine and beer at 3.2% legal. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar, that isn't bad, 3.2%. That's a light beer today, perhaps. A regular bottle of beer has between 4.5 and 5% alcohol. So 3.2 was pretty good at that time. And this was the day in history when prohibition went out the window. Now we go to 1944. Sad event occurred in 1944. We were at war with Germany and Japan. The 8th Air Force, the 8th Army Air Force was stationed in Europe. On this day in 1944, over 600 bombers of the 8th Air Force, hear me, over 600 bombers of the 8th Air Force bombed Berlin in one day. Over 600 bombers of the 8th Air Force bombed one city on one day. Uh, had to be. I mean, this was a bad war. Had to be. Well, what's interesting is that you don't need today 600 bombers to bomb Berlin. You can wipe Berlin out with one small nuclear weapon. You can wipe out a small country with one nuclear weapon. You can wipe out the whole northeastern United States with one nuclear weapon. Uh, we've gone that far. We don't need all this. We can do it this way. But it was sad it had to be done that way. It's sad it had to be done, period, to Berlin back then. Uh, it was sad it had to be done that way. So big, 600 bombers. And it's even more sad that today we don't need all that manpower. We need one bomb. Okay, let's talk about marijuana. We talked about alcohol. Let's talk about marijuana. There is a move. There is a move in the state of Florida now 
to have on the ballot in 2014, the next ballot, uh, the right to have to sell and use medical marijuana. Not personal, medical marijuana. Money has been committed to putting this on the ballot. It comes from the starting money. They need $10 million to run this campaign. The big money initially now has come from two major donors who were donors to Obama. They want this, they want medical marijuana legalized for this reason, very simple. One had a parent who was dying of cancer. The, the pot made the life of that person better based on the chemotherapy and everything else. There was no suffering. The other had a parent who had Parkinson's disease. The pot con controlled the shakes, the tremors. It's anticipated this is going to pass. There's no opposition to it, no organized opposition. Further, everyone's encouraged because in 2012, Massachusetts, Colorado, and the state of Washington approved marijuana for general use, okay? And a poll recently taken in Florida shows 70% of the people favor medical marijuana. So it's on its way, it is coming, and it's going to be here. We have come to the end of the show another Friday. I thank you for joining me today. Uh, I tell you again, as I tell you most weeks, come on down and visit us in Key West. The weather is delightful. It's going to be 80 degrees today. There is absolutely no humidity. We're going to have humidity in a month, but we have no humidity right now. Uh, it's just a good time to be here. Uh, and the people are nice here. And so we hope you come. I thank you for joining me this week. I'll see you again next week.